American democracy is under attack. There is precious little time to save it. Many still are not focused on the greatest risk, state houses. Corrupt politicians in state houses across the country are experimenting with ways to undermine democracy in a cynical quest for power. David Pepper, author of Laboratories of Autocracy, joins us to talk about this ongoing threat and about his book. David Pepper is a lawyer, writer, political activist, former elected official, and adjunct professor. And he served as the chairman of the Ohio Democratic Party between 2015 and 2021. He has engaged in numerous fights and extensive litigation over voter suppression and election laws in the Buckeye State. This free online event will take place on Sunday, March 6th at 5 p.m. Pacific Time. To register, go to tinyurl.com slash democracy autocracy. That's tinyurl.com slash democracy autocracy. And I'll see you there. At long last, the glorious invasion of Ukraine begins. Soon, the motherland will take the wayward province into her firm embrace again. Field Marshal Putin offers cheers and many celebrations for American comrades who showed loyalty to Mother Russia. We have much gratitude and thanks for Fox News, most especially Comrade Tucker Carlson. For his loyalty, we'll receive highest Russian honor, the Order of Lenin. We thank Steve Bannon, admirer and student of Comrade Lenin, who led the Republicans to support of Comrade Putin's plans for Greater Russia. We thank GOP Comrade Senator Joshua Howley, who blocked enemies of Russia that the warmonger Biden wished to appoint to his regime. Russia waits 40 years for American Republicans to throw away disgrace of Ronald Reagan. Republicans say they stand for America. Comrade Putin knows better. Last night was the most horrific for Kiev since, just imagine, 1941. when it was attacked by Nazis. Last night was attacked by someone who pretends they are fighting with neo-Nazism. Therefore, I'm not surprised that Russia voted against. Russia is keen on continuing its Nazi-style course of action. The Kremlin regime should not be called Russian regime. The Kremlin regime should be called Russist regime. A couple of hours ago, my president said, and then quote, tonight the enemy will use all the forces at their disposal to break our resistance, while cruel and inhuman. Tonight, they will storm. We must all understand what awaits us. We have to persevere tonight. The fate of Ukraine is being decided right now, end of quote. We just heard something that the Russian ambassador wanted to present pres present as assurances from himself and from his leadership that it's all provocation. And that he urged us not to yield to, pro pro to provocations. Do you remember how many times he said that? And uh, 
his deputies said in this very room that there will be no invasion, no attacks. Do you remember how during the previous session he was moving, walking out of uh, the chamber trying to call someone, not knowing what was going on? How we can trust you? How we can trust your assurance? You have no idea what is on the mind of your president. Your words have less value that, than a hole in the New York pretzel. The Russian Federation that occupied by treachery, the seat of the Security Council member in 1991, violates daily not only the charter, but also the provisions, provisional rules of uh, procedure of this council. Because if Russia did not violate the provisional rules, then Mr. Nebenzia had to follow Article Rule 20. Let me quote. I begin the quote. For the proper fulfillment of the responsibilities of the presidency, he should not preside over the council during the consideration of a particular question with which the member he represents, that's the Russian Federation, is directly connected. He, the rule reads, shall indicate his decision to the council not to preside. So since the council is not ruled by the current presidency by rules, I will be probably also unruly. And I will ask all of you to dedicate a moment of complete silence to pray or to meditate if you do not believe in God for peace to pray for souls of those who has been already killed, for souls of those who may be killed. And I invite the Russian ambassador to pray for salvation. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let us spend a moment in a complete silence. I apologize, but before moving to a moment of silence, I want to include in the list those people who perished over all these years in Donbass. They also are worthy of being mentioned. Any, uh, all human lives are valuable. Let's not forget them either. But let's, ladies and gentlemen, spend a moment in complete silence. Thank you. I thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You know, the people of Crimea, from what I've heard, would rather be with Russia than where they were. Do you like Vladimir Putin's comments about you? Sure. When people call you brilliant, it's always good, especially when the person heads up Russia. Yeah. Well, I mean, it also is a person that kills journalists, political al I mean, uh, political opponents, yeah. and uh, invades countries. And invades countries. Obviously, uh, that uh, it would be a concern, would it not? He's running this country, and at least he's a leader. You know, unlike what we have in this country. Yeah, but again, he kills journalists that don't agree with him. Well, I think uh, our country does plenty of killing also, Joe. So. Putin's a killer. A lot of killers. We get a lot of killers. Why, you think our country's so innocent? No, no, think of it. You know, it's Russia, after all. Somebody said, are you at all offended that he said nice things about you?
I said, no. In all fairness to Putin, you're saying he killed people. I haven't seen that. I don't know that he has. Have you been able to prove that? Do you know the names of the reporters that he's killed? I had a uh, call with President Putin and congratulated him on the victory, his electoral victory. I want to thank him because we're trying to cut down on payroll. We'll save a lot of money. I like him because he called me a genius. You know, the people of Crimea, from what I've heard, would rather be with Russia than where they were. The Russian military has begun a brutal assault on the people of Ukraine. Without provocation, <clears throat> without justification, without necessity, this is a premeditated attack. Vladimir Putin has been planning this for months, as I've been, we've been saying all along. He moved more than 175,000 troops, military equipment, in positions along the Ukrainian border. He moved blood supplies into position and <clears throat> built a field hospital, which uh, tells you all you need to know about his intentions all along. He rejected every good faith effort the United States and our allies and partners made to address our mutual security concerns through dialogue to avoid needless conflict and avert human suffering. For weeks, for weeks, we have been warning that this would happen. And now, it's unfolding largely as we predicted. In the past week, we've seen shelling increase in the Donbas, a region in eastern Ukraine controlled by Russian-backed separatists. Rus the Russian government has perpetrated cyber attacks against Ukraine. We saw a staged political theater in Moscow, outlandish and baseless claims that Ukraine was, a, Ukraine was about to invade and launch a war against Russia, that Ukraine was prepared to use chemical weapons, that Ukraine committed a genocide. Without any evidence, we saw a flagrant violation of international law in attempting to unilaterally create two new so-called republics on sovereign Ukrainian territory. And at the very moment that the United Nations Security Council was meeting to stand up for U Ukraine's sovereignty, to stave off invasion, Putin declared his war. Within moments, moments, missile strikes began to fall on historic cities across Ukraine. Then came the air raids, followed by tanks and troops rolling in. We've been transparent with the world, We've shared declassified evidence about Russia's plans and cyber attacks and false pretexts so that there could be no confusion or cover-up about what Putin was doing. Putin is the aggressor. Putin chose this war. And now he and his country will bear the consequences. Today, I'm authorizing additional strong sanctions and new limitations on what can be exported to Russia. This is going to impose severe cost on the Russian economy, both immediately and over time. We have purposefully designed these sanctions to maximize the long-term impact on Russia and to minimize the impact on the United States and our allies. And I want to be clear, the United States is not doing this alone. For months, we've been building a coalition of partners representing well more than half the global economy. 27 members of the European Union, including France, Germany, Italy, as well as the United Kingdom, Canada, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and many others, to amplify the joint impact of our response. I just spoke with the G7 leaders this morning, and we're in full and total agreement. We will limit Russia's ability to do business in dollars, euros, pounds, and yen to be part of the global economy. We'll limit their ability to do that. We're going to stunt the ability of, to finance and grow Rus the, the Russian military. We're going to impose major — and we're going to impair their ability to compete in high-tech 21st century economy. We've already seen the impact of our actions on Russia's currency and the ruble, which early today hit its weakest level ever, ever in history. The Russian stock market plunged today. The Russian government borrowing rates spiked by over 15 percent. In today's actions, we've now sanctioned Russian banks that together hold around $1 trillion in assets. We've cut off Russia's largest bank, a bank that holds more than one-third of Russia's banking assets by itself, 
cut it off from the U.S. financial system. And today, we're also blocking four more major banks. That means every asset they have in America will be frozen. This includes VTB, the second largest bank in Russia, which has $250 billion in assets. As promised, we're also adding the names to the list of Russian elites and their family members that are sanctioning — that were sanctioned as well. As I said on Tuesday, these are people who personally gain from the Kremlin's policies, and they should share in the pain. We will keep up this drumbeat of those designations against corrupt billionaires in the days ahead. On Tuesday, we stopped the Russian government from raising money from U.S. or European investors. Now we're going to apply the same restrictions to Russia's largest state-owned enterprises, companies with assets that exceed $1.4 trillion. Some of the most powerful impacts our actions will come over time. As we squeeze Russians' access to finances and technology for strategic sectors of its economy and degrade its industrial capacity for years to come. Between our actions and those of our allies and partners, we estimate that we'll cut off more than half of Russia's high-tech imports. And we'll strike a blow to their ability to continue to modernize their military. It'll degrade their aerospace industry, including their space program. It'll hurt their ability to build ships, reducing their ability to compete economically. And it will be a major hit to Putin's long-term strategic ambitions. And we're preparing to do more. In addition to the economic penalties we're imposing, we're also taking steps to defend our NATO allies, particularly in the East. Tomorrow, NATO will convene a summit — we'll be there — to bring together the leaders of 30 allied nations and close partners to affirm our solidarity and to map out the next steps we will take to further strengthen all aspects of our NATO alliance. Although we provided over $650 million in defensive assistance to Ukraine just this year — it's last year — let me say it again. Our forces are not and will not be engaged in the conflict with Russia in Ukraine. Our forces are not going to Europe to fight in Ukraine, but to defend our NATO allies and reassure those allies in the East. As I made crystal clear, the United States will defend every inch of NATO territory with the full force of American power. And the good news is, NATO is more united and more determined than ever. There is no doubt, no doubt that the United States and every NATO ally will meet our Article 5 commitments, which says an attack on one is an attack on all. Over the past few weeks, I ordered thousands of additional forces to Germany and Poland as part of our commitment to NATO. On Tuesday, in response to Russia's aggressive action, including its troop presence in Belarus and the Black Sea, I've authorized the deployment of ground and air forces already stationed in Europe to NATO's eastern flank allies — Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and Romania. Our allies have also been stepping up, adding the other allies, the rest of NATO, adding their own forces and capabilities to ensure collective defense. And today, within hours of Russia's unleashing its assault, NATO came together and authorized and activated an activation of response plans. This will enable NATO's high readiness forces to deploy and when and where they are needed to protect our NATO allies on the eastern boundaries of Europe. And now I'm authorizing additional U.S. force capabilities to deploy to Germany as part of NATO's response, including some of the U.S.-based forces that the Department of Defense placed on standby weeks ago. I've also spoken with Defense Secretary Austin and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs General Milley about preparations for additional moves should they become necessary to protect our NATO allies and support the greatest military alliance in the history of the world, NATO. As we respond, my administration is using the tools — every tool at its disposal — to protect American families and businesses from rising prices at the gas pump. You know, we're taking active steps to bring down the cost, and American oil and gas companies should not — should not exploit this moment to hike their prices to raise profits. You know, in our sanctions package, we specifically designed to allow energy payments to continue. We are closely monitoring energy supplies for any disruption. 
We've been coordinating with major oil producing and consuming countries toward our common interest to secure global energy supplies. We are actively working with countries around the world to elevate collective release from the strategic petroleum reserves of major energy consuming countries. And the United States will release additional barrels of oil as conditions warrant. I know this is hard and that Americans are already hurting. I will do everything in my power to limit the pain the American people are feeling at the gas pump. This is critical to me. But this aggression cannot go unanswered. If it did, the consequences for America would be much worse. America stands up to bullies. We stand up for freedom. This is who we are. Let me also repeat the warning I made last week. If Russia pursues cyber attacks against our companies, our critical infrastructure, we are prepared to respond. For months, we've been working closely with, our pri with the private sector to harden their cyber defenses, sharpen our ability to respond to Russian cyber attacks as well. I spoke last night to President Zelensky of Ukraine, and I assured him that the United States, together with our allies and partners in Europe, will support the Ukrainian people as they defend their country. We'll provide you humanitarian relief to ease their suffering. And in the early days of this conflict, Russia propaganda outlets will keep trying to hide the truth and claim success for its military operation against a made-up threat. But history has shown time and again how swift gains in territory eventually give way to grinding occupations, acts of mass civil, mass civil disobedience, and strategic dead ends. The next few weeks and months, we hard on the people of Ukraine. Putin has unleashed a great pain on them. But the Ukrainian people have known 30 years of independence. And they have repeatedly shown that they will not tolerate anyone who tries to take their country backwards. This is a dangerous moment for all of Europe, for the freedom around the world. Putin has committed an assault on the very principles that uphold the global peace. But now, the entire world sees clearly what Putin and his Kremlin and, and, and his Kremlin allies are really all about. This was never about a genuine security concerns on their part. It was always about naked aggression, about Putin's desire for empire by any means necessary, by bullying Russia's neighbors through coercion and corruption, by changing borders by force, and ultimately by choosing a war without a cause. Putin's actions betray his sinister vision for the future of our world, one where nations take what they want by force. But it is a vision that the United States and freedom-loving nations everywhere will oppose with every tool of our considerable power. The United States and our allies and partners will merge from this stronger, more united, more determined, and more purposeful. And Putin's aggression against Ukraine will end up costing Russia dearly economically and strategically. We will make sure of that. Putin will be a pariah on the international stage. Any nation that countenances Russia's naked aggression against Ukraine will be stained by association. When the history of this era is written, Putin's choice to make a totally unjustifiable war on Ukraine will have left Russia weaker and the rest of the world stronger. Liberty, democracy, human dignity, these are the forces far more powerful than fear and oppression. They cannot be extinguished by tyrants like Putin and his armies. They cannot be erased by people, from people's hearts and hopes by any amount of violence and intimidation. They endure in the contest between democracy and autocracy, between sovereignty and subjugation. Make no mistake. Freedom will prevail. God bless the people of a free and democratic Ukraine. May God protect our troops. A D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser first called Army Secretary Ryan McCarthy to ask for help at 1.34 p.m. 
It looks now like the Capitol the, the police. Yeah, now, Pete, let me break away from you a back. second because things are happening very quickly. According to your written testimony, you were, quote, aware that demonstrators had breached the Capitol.